This week on the latest episode of The Big Show, we explore the top highest grossing opening weekend films, plus it's Black Music Month. And we will discuss the life of Ray, what you say, Charles. In addition, Ms. Marvel, season three of The Boys, and for Charles, the final special from Norm MacDonald, which is entitled Norm MacDonald, Nothing Special. Uh, we will discuss that as well as countdown to the sixth annual Black Reel Awards for television nominations. We'll have all that and more on episode 503 of Keeping It Real with Film Gordon. Let's go. All right, and welcome to the latest episode of Keeping It Real with Film Gordon. I am Tim Gordon. That is Charles Kirkland Jr. How you doing, Charles? I'm doing good. I'm rocking my orange in support of the outrage over the gun violence that we've encountered in our nation in the last however many years. So, <laughs> forever. Uh, <laughs> forever. <laughs> but, but, gun uh, violence so, didn't did just start. No. It's been going yeah. on since 1776 when this country was formed and before that when if people had guns. So... Yeah, man, but it is a tense time right now, bro. I will, I will give you that much, man. I mean, think about it. President Biden was giving an address on gun violence, and after the address was over, there was another shooting. And that's not a joke. That's like something that really happened. So, yeah, yeah, we, we're, in a, we're in a really interesting place, and the answer is not buy more guns. Because, you know, people are like, well, you know, in order to be no. Just buy more guns is not the answer, man. So, but thank you, Charles, for uh, doing that, man. And also, it's Black Music Month. It's Pride Month. There's a bunch of months going on. Uh, today, somebody called me this morning and told me today was National Donut Day, which uh, I'm trying to keep my grown and sexy uh, waistline, so I couldn't participate in, in National Donut Day today. Are you kidding me? You get a free donut at Krispy Kreme just for walking you get a, in the You get a free donut everywhere you go. You go to Dunkin' Donuts, you buy a drink, they give you a donut. Everybody's giving out donuts. You get a free donut. You don't have to buy anything at Krispy Kreme. You just walk in the door. I uh, know, man. And, and no, we're not. I'm not. I mean, I'm not hating on. Well, actually, I'm hating on all y'all because none of y'all sponsor this show. So we ain't going <laughs> to say their names again, right? <laughs> I just said it was National Donut Day. Charles got, well, if you go to blah, 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 nah, there's no blah, blah, blah until blah, blah, blah cuts us a check, all right? All right, man, so we got a lot of stuff to talk about this week, man, and I thought about you. Um, one of the things you heard me tease, uh, Netflix released uh, Norm MacDonald's final comedy special, which was called Nothing Special, uh, where they, which, which is what I thought that they did, and I'm assuming you watch this. I did. Okay, cool. One of the things that I think they did, which was really, really interesting, is that not only did Norm McDonald do this at his house, sort of like we're doing this, this podcast today, on Zoom uh, with no audience, uh, despite the fact that he had a dog in the background and people wanted to call him while it was going on. But at the end of it, several of his friends, including I think it was Dave Letterman, Adam, Adam Sandler, uh, Rob Schneider, Molly Shannon, Conan O'Brien, and Dave Chappelle all sat around with their memories of not just him, but the special that he performed, which I thought was really, really a cool idea. So whoever at Netflix came up with that, that was great. Um, Charles, I mean, I enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was really interesting because in watching it, I had to watch it in pairs because I was so impatient to want to hear the stories of Norm Macdonald that I kind of watched half of it and then kind of fast forwarded to what the what what the uh, other comedians were talking about and then I came back re-listened because you know it's I think Dave Chappelle was like oh the, the ending was so earnest you know uh how he winds up getting to that final joke um, but, you know, I know you like Norm Macdonald. I remember when he passed and I was talking about great comedians and I didn't bring Norm Macdonald's name up. And, you know, you were lulling your feelings, man. So, you know, it was. Talk to I me was. About, about Norm Macdonald, man. Um, so in other words, you're telling me that you didn't watch the Norm Macdonald special no, because, no, you, you, because you didn't watch it from front to back well, all, all the way through in one sitting. I'm a pro. <laughs> 
right? And when you were pro, you know, I watch. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We're not I going watch for the that parts because... that need to be watched so that I can. Oh, no, we're not, we're not going for that. We're not going for that. You did you know, not. sort watch of like when a person, so when a person like... watches half the Godfather and then the other half the Godfather and then puts that experience together right. and says that he watched the Godfather. So, so if the logic holds up, then you haven't seen the special either. So we'll we'll just go we'll just go for at it from there. But yeah, I have much respect for Norm McDonald, and it's not the first time he's shown up in recent weeks because he was also in the hall. Remember, they did this the right. tribute to him, um, and so you know I have much respect for him. I thought he's underrated as a comic, I, and uh, uh, well in the world of comedy he was much respected but outside of it for those of us who were watching not as not as much love as say some other comedians would have but that, that's all well and good because he 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 carved out a and i thought the uh special was creative in like you said the way that he did it um and i don't know i think there was a tinge of sadness as well watching it because you know, this was his last special, and it, and it seemed like he was kind of squeezing it in to get it done because of the COVID and everything. That he may have known that he didn't have much time left, so it, it was it was nice, and it was also kind of bittersweet as well. So I enjoyed it. Go ahead. See, for somebody who just tried to give me the business about not watching the special, when the special opened, it talked about he was going in in the in the script. It's I'm, trying about be, him going I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be spoiler, I, 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 I'm trying to be spoiler don't, free don't here. Don't I'm don't trying to be spoiler free here. No, it okay. is. I mean, it's not like it's a it's not like it's a it's a mystery or it's a it's nobody knew this. He was going in for a procedure, right? And he had a feeling that some things may not have worked out, and he wanted to record this before he went in. So that it was under that, it was what Charles was trying to say, that it wasn't like he, it was because of COVID. It was because of COVID, but he was going in for something that he thought was really serious. And he does this one hour special where he talks about his own mortality. He talks about death. He talk, I mean, he talks about a lot of stuff and it's very emotional in some points in there with Norm MacDonald. So I can imagine, it, it reminded me a lot of, watching uh the michael jackson documentary this is this is it mm -hmm. when we knew that michael this was the last thing that michael jackson had ever done and, and, and the closer it gets to the end it kind of starts to hit you like man i'm not gonna get any more michael jackson this is it so norm mcdonald's nothing special is absolutely ironic because it's very special of what he did and you heard his friends talk about you know, he didn't tell them. They didn't know. You know, nobody, nobody, nobody was really interested, man. So if you get an opportunity, Norm McDonald, nothing special. His final stand up on the channel uh, is airing now. So if you get an opportunity this weekend, I, I think it's about an hour and a half with the commentary with right. uh, with, the, with the group. It's really, really well worth it. And then I forgot, Charles, to pivot. We keep talking about Norm McDonald. Season three of uh, the Orville premiered, uh, you know, I guess early this week. And Charles is laughing because as that opens, it is dedicated to Norm McDonald, who was a cast member, albeit he didn't play himself, but he voiced a character that was on the show. Charles, did you get a chance? I asked you this yesterday. Did you get a chance to see the, the, the premiere episode? I think it's now called... The Orville, hold on one second. I, I want to make sure I get this right. Because well, they. Well, to answer your question as you're a asking it, no, I have not watched the Orville yet. Oh, really good episode, bro. Really. I, you know, look, look, look. No, no, no. I, I'm not being funny. New Horizons, Orville, New Horizons. I'm not. I, mm. I Seth want you to McFarlane. watch it first. I think Seth MacFarlane is another one of those guys. He's very clever in his humor, and he—I mean, he's done—he's done a great job with this show, and uh, so I, you know, I enjoy his work as well. So I mean, I haven't gotten around to watching it because you know, you know what life is like for no, no, no. For, I know, I know, <laughs> but, but I just want to say, um, much like when we were talking about This Is Us, and I tell you that my thought—I told you that my favorite episode. 
I think it was season one, I want to say it was either 16 or 17 called Memphis, right? Seth MacFarlane, uh, and, and of course, if you haven't watched The Orville, I know it's now on Hulu. So they moved it off of Fox and now Hulu has picked it up. And it's now, they call it The Orville New Horizons, which is season three. There was an episode in season two, uh, episode 12. Um, I don't remember the actual title, but Charles, this was the one when they sent down a shuttle from the Orville to do some exploration on some planet. Oh, yeah. And they got down there and they saw some, some folks from like the sixth century or something like this. You remember this episode? I do, and I do. You talk about something that's smartly written that one of the crew members who's named Kelly uh, helps out this young girl using technology that doesn't exist in their time. And the end result is that this planet, once they get back to their, their craft, they get back to the Orville, it disappears. And then every, what is it? Every 11 days, it comes back. But every time it comes back in 11 days, it's they advanced. move forward like 700 years. Right. So when they come back the next time, they now have a new religion and a new God on this planet. And it's the, it's the book of Kelly, you know, <laughs> instead of saying, oh, Jesus Christ. So now it's like, hey, kids, you don't get your stuff right. Kelly going to come and get it. <laughs> so I thought, I thought that episode, I probably watched more than any other episode because to me, it's so deep and fundamental how something like that could happen. Right. And I say all that to say that season three, episode one, what Seth MacFarlane did is nothing short of astounding. I watched I've watched that episode three times already. When you see it, you'll see that it's something that I think emotionally hits hits really, really hard. And and think about the irony of when you watch it in order to get that that sort of an emotion from a character that shows none. So it would almost be like if you're watching Star Trek and something happened to Spock and you're like, but Spock has no, but you would get this really emotional. So this episode is highly, it, it's very well written. Very, and I love, I love intellect and I love good writing. The writing, top notch. The subject matter, very in your face and that you would, you know, something that is universal. Okay. And the fact that they were able to explore something tragic that happens and something that we deal with every day. I just thought, I'm like Seth MacFarlane and he wrote this episode and directed this episode as well as starring in it. And um, hold on one second, I just want to double check because I, I don't want to misrepresent it. You hear some of the reviews. Orville season three review. New Horizons is definitely worth the wait. Uh, let's see. Orville is back. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's absolutely great. I don't know what the title of the episode is. It's a really, really well-written episode, Charles. So that's why I kept asking you. You, you haven't seen it yet? <sighs> haven't seen it? I, I know Fox is probably kicking themselves because they canceled the show last year. And so uh, Hulu brought it back. Right. And so with this episode, <laughs> I know Seth McFarland's like, yeah, take that. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Well, we're going in inverse order, man, because we're going to get to um, uh, talking about the highest gross and weekends. But I just wanted to get some of these shows out the way first. Season three of The Boys. Wow. Um, okay. Charles and I have had uh, <laughs> season. Charles and I have had several conversations about this and as critics. Um, we are, are blessed, I would say. I wouldn't say we lucky. We blessed enough in order to get preview copies of shows before you get a chance to see it. Hence, we come on the show and tell you about it. And I already knew, like, if you've ever watched The Boys, the very first episode where you have a scene where the guy is standing on the curb and he's talking mm -hmm. to his girl, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden... I wouldn't even say in the snap of a finger, in the blink of an eye, suddenly everything, as a good friend of mine likes to say, went inexplicably and horribly wrong. Horribly wrong. This woman just literally disintegrates. And, and he's holding her hands 
like having a conversation. He goes to say something and all he has left is some hands in his hand and her body is gone. And you look to the right and there's a character on the boys who's like the Flash that was out there running, not really paying attention and literally for lack of a better term, just killed this woman, right? Ran right through her. Ran right through her, right? So I say all that to say, and and and, and I'm not going to spoil it, but I want to say it tastefully. Charles, I was sitting in the house screening this for review, right? And I was sitting with the young man who, you know, is here with me and, you know, we watching shows. I kind of use him because he kind of explains you know, son, you know, son sitting here, you know, we kind of watching the show together. And they got to a portion of the show. And I'm watching it and I'm laughing because I'm like, man, it's just the boys being the boys. You know, they're always doing stuff that's kind of over the line. And Charles, let's just say, after that scene, I was so <laughs> scarred. I didn't, I didn't watch any more of that episode of the boys. And I haven't watched any of the boys since. That was <laughs> horrific. What are you doing? <laughs> so I called Charles up the next day and was like, Charles, have you seen the boys yet? <laughs> and then you watched it. Uh, so Charles, go ahead, man. I, I, I don't think I don't I don't think we spoiled anything, man. But I just thought that it was gratuitous. It was you thought it was funny. I was like. There's just certain stuff, man. Like, I, I don't need, and, and you know, this is this gets back to something, Charles, that you've always heard me say, that I'm careful in what I watch because once you watch it, you can't unsee it. Can't unsee it. And no, this is one of those, like, I saw this and I can't unsee it and I didn't want to see it. You didn't ask my permission, but go ahead, Charles. You, 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 season Burn. three of The Boys, episode one. The whole thing is just burned into my brain for the rest of my life. I will never, ever, ever forget what I saw in episode one. And it's in the first, I'd say, first 10 minutes of, the, of that episode that this happens. And I'm like, this has got to be the weirdest, craziest, most gratuitous. I, I mean, I just, it was, I had to laugh. Sometimes you can laugh at things because there's no way other way to cope with it but just the whole concept how they came up with this and you you knew where it was going but to see it happen i was like oh my god this is horrible this is horrible the boys is known for just like you said gratuitous violence i mean from beginning to end and so this was a scene that, man, yeah. I mean, there's been other, uh, there's been more violence in the episodes after it, but nothing compares. Like Sinead O'Connor would say from her old Prince song, "Nothing compares, <laughs> nothing compares." I'm, I'm like, no, that that was that was way over the top. What? I was like, Jesus, Pete. Oh, man. But I'm watching the boys. I'm watching it. I'm not going to stop watching. I'm going to have to rely on you and ask somebody to watch it in advance. So if there's something now, happens, now the, the boys also had a little, the, the boys also had a little spinoff, a show called Diabolical, which was a, which they were a lot of uh, animated spinoff stories from the boys. Right. And, and one of the episodes in, I think it's episode three ties into some of the stuff that happened in one of the animated uh, uh, stories, which was which I thought was really cool. But I mean, if you think the show is bad, the gratuitous violence in the animated series because you can get a lot more, get away with a lot more in animation. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> it's even worse. It's even worse. So I don't know. All right, man. All right. Uh, the boys is on uh, Amazon Prime right now. If you if you dare, you you go and take that journey, man. I, I'm a pass right now because there's other stuff I could be watching uh, that will not be seared into my memory banks in the way that uh, episode one of the boys is. I've never I've never seen a snuff series before, but this is what it is. It's a snuff series. Oh, my God. All right. Well, we got a couple more series we need to talk about. 
Um, I know we're talking about the debut of series, but I'm going to take a break for a second to spotlight uh, a brilliant episode, season one, episode three of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And this is notable because there is a return and uh, the, the young man that I sat and watched this show with was geeking out like a, like, like a kid. I mean, an even younger kid when one James Earl Jones returned to voice the iconic villain, super villain, Darth Vader. Um, so, it, man, if there's a, uh, you know, we, I know people talk about J.R. Ewing and they talk about all of these, these characters. Who is much more of a villain than... Vader <laughs> returns in Obi Wan Kenobi, and they got ninety-one year old James Earl Jones to come back and voice this character. Charles, I mean, you are more steeped in the Star Wars universe than I. What did this mean to you? I to I told you like th two episodes ago when we were talking about Obi Wan coming. I was like. Uh, James Earl Jones forever, baby. There's nobody that can be the voice. If they ever even tried to get somebody else to be the voice of Darth Vader, there would be there would be riots in the street. Somebody would take Disney stock and just burn it if they if they tried to do something crazy like that. So yes, to see here James Earl Jones voicing Darth Vader again. I was ecstatic. I, I, my, I, me and my son, we both sat down watching this one, and we, we're both falling out because it's, it is iconic. I mean, you talk about villains. I think he's been voted. Vader's been voted the number one most iconic villain of all time, and to bring James Earl Jones back, perfect, perfect. Mwah. All right, uh, I'm in my studio, which is in my house, watching this, and you see me keep looking over the television. I am looking at, and this is not iconic by any means, but it was just one of the most fun things I ever remember when this show was on. Uh, Entourage. Um, the final episode of Entourage, the final scene when Vince Chase gives E his own plane with his girl, and oh my God. Look, I'm sorry. Ah, ah, gets me every time. Oh man. Anyway, <laughs> look at y'all looking at me. What, man? I'm, I'm we, a, just, we were just talking about Darth Vader, and you talking about Darth Vader. I, I, agree, I agree that Darth Vader is uh, in a separate pantheon of his own as a person who, uh, or as a character. And I think uh, the young woman by the name of Moses Ingram who is in this show, who is, is drawing so much criticism from people. People, just relax, yo. I mean, you can't get mad at every Black character that's in the, in the Star Wars universe. You don't get mad at Darth Vader. That's a brother. Ain't nobody getting mad at James Earl Jones. Maybe because you just hear him and you don't see him. Maybe that's part of what it is, Charles. But it's a character, man. And the fact that you guys are mad at her shows that she's doing a really good job because whatever she's doing is affecting you. So Obi-Wan Kenobi, check it out on, a, on Disney Plus. Really, really good show. And finally, Charles, also on Disney Plus, Ms. Marvel drops this week. Uh, we've had an opportunity to see the first two episodes. And again, as a guy who is a comic novice, what I've been told is that the way that the show is put together by its creators and showrunners is very indicative of the world of the comic book that Mrs. Marvel occupies. I think it's a really good show. And here's a difference, right? Because you always hear me use this phrase every time we review one of these uh, kind of MCU shows about the connective tissue. I understand the connective tissue to Mrs. Marvel that she's, she's going to end up being a young Avenger, Charles. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so I did a little research because, you know, I didn't want to be like, Charles, I don't get it. I don't understand. Um, but I thought Mrs. Marvel was good. I, I really liked the direction of the show. I like the cultural aspects that I think that Disney captures well, much like when they, uh, I'm looking forward to the Wakanda uh, uh, Disney Plus series, which I think is going to culturally do the same thing. 
So you don't think so? I, it could. It could. Okay. But right, I, so I thought you would mean, also compare it to uh, Miss Marvel. I thought you would also compare it to what they did with Shang Chi, uh, as oh. well as creating these cultural environments that are very inclusive and accepting. And I, I thought it was very well done. It reminded me a lot of Spider Man Into the Spider Verse, if if people have seen that about how creative and and, and uh, interactive the the uh, the film is with. The, I mean, because, you know, in comic books, you, you have dialogue boxes that pop up and people speak, but there's, but they're very different in, in the way they create conversation in, in the, com, in Miss Marvel comic books. And they did a very good job of bringing that to the screen. So I thought that was cool. I thought it was really cool. All right. So we've opened the show up, man, by kind of going through uh, some of the shows and some of the news that we need to go through. So let's jump in to uh, today's main topic. And of course, this was spurred by a conversation that I had with Charles Kirkland Jr., or as I like to call him, CKJ. And CKJ called me up, Charles Kirkland Jr., CKJ. Um, He called me up after news broke about Top Gun Maverick. Now, if you've been watching this show the last several weeks, um, you will know we did a summer movie preview show and we talked about uh, since the pandemic has started, the only genre of movies that have made money have been superhero films. And you talked about films like Jurassic World, Dominion, uh, Top Gun Maverick, and several others that are coming out this summer that are outside of that genre. And whether these movies would be able to attract people, right? Right. So the, so the first test, of course, was Tom Cruise. And um, let's just say... I knew going in that there was a huge nostalgic piece to Top Gun because I saw Top Gun when I was, you know, in uh, early 20 something, you know, that booming soundtrack. I'm a, I'm a guy. So the guys didn't really like women thought that the guys were sexy, you know, those volleyball scenes where they out there all oiled up and stuff. And, <laughs> yeah, None of that did it for me, but stuff like Berlin's take my breath away uh, Kenny Loggins, uh, high, what is it? Highway, highway to the danger zone. zone. You know, all these songs, man, that I thought that moved the soundtrack. And this was that period where we had dirty dancing and footloose and all these films that had come out during that time, as well as stuff like Miami vice in 85. So we were, we were in this kind of eighties musical visuals merging together. Right. And it was interesting to me, Charles, when we watched the film and we talked about it, that, you know, they they brought back the same creative team for the most part, the same director, the same star, some, of you know, maybe a couple of the actors, and then they just, you know, enhanced it for 2022 or 2019 or 2020, whenever it initially was supposed to have been released. But the fact that they kept to me, the structure of the story so similar. I mean, it was a it was a sequel, but it felt like they were reintroducing you to Maverick all over again and Maverick shenanigans and you know the connective tissue, my favorite phrase, with Val Kilmer and some of the other stuff. You know, pictures of goose around. You know, an opening that literally is the same opening from the first film. Um, but this me. movie resonated. It resonated, Charles, $124 million, man. So you talk about the impact of of why it took Tom Cruise 40 years to finally break through this coveted club that there are only 64 movies that have ever opened with $100 $100 million. And to your point, which you're going to talk about, it's only a phenomenon that's 20 years old. It just started 20 years ago. A month ago. So we're 20 years and one month into the phenomenon known as the $100 million film. And, and so, uh, I, you know, it was amazing to me. And, and like you said, when Tom Cruise, you said he's never had a $100 million movie before. And I remember, I, I know right off the top of my head, Spider-Man that came out in uh, 2002, was the first ever one hundred million dollar movie, and so we're, it's literally been a year, a uh, ten years in a month, uh, twenty years in a month since the uh, first hundred dollar opening weekend movie, 
And so, yes, this is a, a, a phenomenon that is quite recent. And, and, and to our surprise, people like Will Smith, uh, who, you know, was Mr. Uh, uh, Independence Day. I mean, every oh, Independence I'm Day, he had Blockbuster come out. He's never had a hundred million dollar opening movie. Mm -hmm. And so, which, I mean, unless you count Suicide Squad, which he was in an ensemble, but I mean, he's never led a movie on his own, uh, had a movie of his own that opened up a hundred million dollars, not Hancock, not Independence Day, not uh, I Am Legend, all these things that he did. No, didn't make it. Wow. It's it surprising. It is surprising, man. And, you know, to your point, man, as we're educating people today, to Charles's point, May 3rd, 2002, Sam Raimi directed Spider-Man. Spider-Man opened up at 100. I'm trying to find the site uh, that gives me the actual total of what he did in 2002. I think I'm getting it. But it was like 116. Yeah. So since that, since that opening weekend, um, there there have only been 60 three other movies that have been clipped. I'm sorry, let me up $114 million that he did. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I, I see it now. So since that, there have only been 60, a total of 64 movies that have eclipsed the $100 million mark. But here is where it gets interesting, right? So as we were doing our research before the show, I, I, I don't think it's anybody to anybody's surprise that in the top 10, eight of the top 10 movies of all time are from one studio. Walt Disney. <laughs> one of the other films that didn't is not from Disney is Spider-Man No Way Home, which was released uh, this past December, which uh, was a partnership between Sony and Disney. <laughs> so that means that nine of the top 10 films of all time are generated through or in partnership through one studio, Walt Disney. While the rest of the movie industry is playing checkers, they playing chess over at Walt Disney, man, because again, they had the foresight to understand that they were good storytellers, Charles, before they bought Pixar, Marvel Entertainment, and Lucasfilm. So you get Star Wars, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and you get Pixar where they are the best at telling these kind of animated stories. Can't lose at Disney, man. But I wish somebody would tell my, my stock that because my <laughs> stock has been losing for, for several months now. But And I refuse to sell it because they Disney. You're not selling Disney stock? What's wrong with you? <laughs> um, I mean, but yeah, Charles, talk about the impact of Walt Disney as this, you know, I, I hate to use this phrase because this is a, a, a superhero character. Of being a juggernaut. Ooh, I, I knew you were going to say that, but uh, you, you know, you said the nine of the top 10, but it even goes deeper that it's 15 of the top 16 movies uh, on the list are Disney or uh, related, are associated with Disney. The only one that's cracked the top 10 was Jurassic World, and that's it, that uh, through Universal Pictures. So Disney is, I mean, they've got. I mean, they've got everything. And, and so it, they're just a monster. They, and they just throw, put out monster products and keep that stock. That's all I can say. Keep that stock because they it's going to bounce back because they just continue to put out hit after hit after hit after hit. And and the, uh, the, the one cool thing for me, Spider-Man is in the, the top three movies uh, on the list, you got Avengers Endgame, which is the most, Spider-Man No Way Home, second place, and Avengers Infinity War, all three of which had Spider-Man in it. So right. that there's a reason why Sony was like, we're not letting go of the Sony property because Spider-Man, out of the top 64, almost every Spider-Man film is in that top 64, starting off with Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. They're all there somewhere. Wow. Yeah, I'm looking through the list right now. So what is really interesting to me is that there's several studios like Warner Brothers. Uh, you know, I'm not really mad at Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers happens to have number 17, 18, 19, and 20 are all Warner Brothers. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part two is 17. Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice at 18. 
The dark night rises at 19 and the dark night at 20. So Warner Brothers has some films on the list. Lionsgate, ironically, has several films on the list. Uh, the Hunger Games franchise, as well as the Twilight franchise. But if I went through here, Charles, I would venture that I don't know the exact number. And while you're talking and doing a soliloquy, I might count it to find out just how many Walt Disney films are on this list in the top 64. And I don't know if it's half the list. Uh, it's got to be more than a quarter of the list. I'll tell you that much. But that is hella impressive. Hella. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so think about it. Again, we're all talking about in 20 years. In 20 years, Disney has logged 16, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 15 movies in the top of $100 million grossing weekends. I mean, it's incredible. And, and that's just in the top. If you want to go through and count, I, and I'm not at this time, but I'm sure they've got multiple dozens in, the, in this top 64. Uh-huh. 15, 16, 17, 18, hold on a second, 19, 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, wow, 6, 7. Okay, there's 64 films, Charles, in the top uh, top uh, $100 million films. 27 of them are Disney. And then that's not even counting uh, when you, you're looking at uh, the most recent Spider-Man, so you count that as 27A or, or 28. But I mean, I, I was, I, you know, I knew it was more than a quarter. It's not necessarily half, but it's close. I mean, so Walt Disney, man, I can't. And guess can't, what? You probably didn't count like X-Men, which is Fox, but it's oh, now owned right. by I Disney. Didn't count, I didn't count all the 20th Century Fox. So if you count 20th Century Fox stuff, because there's two Deadpools in there, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it is, <laughs> I mean, I remember, I remember several milestones, right? I remember when Disney acquired Marvel and we were like, whoa, because this was Marvel and I, and, and to Disney's credit, the only one that I think they bought where people were like, oh man, is when they spent $4 billion on Lucasfilm, because you had already known what the Star Wars franchise was all about. And people were laughing about, oh man, they're gonna turn the mouse into 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 a, a stormtrooper and all of this stuff. But the one thing that the Walt Disney Company has prided itself on since the beginning, back with with Walt Disney himself, is they know how to tell a story over at Disney, man. And if you look at the MCU, if you look at the Star Wars franchise, if you look at the Pixar films, they are consistently still nailing these films. One after the other, Toy Story, Wally, -E, uh, you know, Up. I mean, so everything they're touching over there for the most part is gold. And even when they make MCU properties that might not necessarily be memorable, like the first Thor or Thor The Dark World, uh, Iron Man 3, you know, it's, they, they're still, like I always talk about them being a big quilt. And that all this stuff weaves together to tell these amazing stories. Um, I'm just trying to figure out, Charles, that they started making these movies in 2008. It is now 2022. Um, I, I, I would say that the MCU is going to outlive us all. You know, they'll still be making these movies. They'll be putting us in the ground. They'd be like, hey, coming up next month. <laughs> The, the 49th movie in the MCU franchise. Don't don't laugh. It's 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 not going anywhere. As long as they have uh, access to the Marvel catalog of of characters, there there's an infinite number of I wouldn't say infinite, but there are so many stories that can be told and directions they can go. And where does it stop? No one knows. No one knows. Well, I, nobody knows because we've never seen anything like this before. I mean, before Disney came along, uh, or Marvel, I should say, came along with the idea of doing a, a cinematic universe, the, the longest running franchise of all time, of course, was James Bond that was started in 1962 and is now 60 years later. But even though they've done 60 years of Bond, they've only made 25 films. Marvel just finished 28 
released in 28 when they released um, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Number 29 is Thor, uh, Love and Thunder. And number 30 is Black Panther 2. So, yeah, I mean, I'm laughing, but there's no end in sight, man. These guys are going to be making these movies. Uh, and, and, and why wouldn't they? They, they made uh, 20 or they released 29 movies and I think they grossed like 27 billion. So these movies, every time out the box, it seems like the formula, Charles, is to spend about 200 million on average to make them. And they usually make and bring back five times the amount of money. And, and of course, that, that number is a little skewed because there's millions of dollars in marketing and all of the other things that they do. Um, but man, it, it is hella. I mean, it, it's easy to talk alone. about. It's hella easy impressive. to talk about Marvel, but you know, we just had Pinocchio premiere, the live action version with Tom Hanks starring as Geppetto. Uh, the Lion King live action was number nine on the list, with one hundred and ninety-one million dollars made uh, in in its opening weekend. Beauty and the Beast is on the list at number fifteen, with one hundred and seventy-four million dollars in its opening weekend so it, i mean we can talk about marvel and, and but they their other properties are are doing quite as well as well uh, uh, i mean they're not slacking in any direction they go well i mean i wanted to go back and revisit something because we talked about 27 right uh that were predominantly from the disney company let me just double check something because i want to see uh with the 20th Century Fox inclusion in it. One, two, wow, <laughs> wow. Okay, let me tell you something that's surprising that, that I just that just dawned on me. Did you know they have Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith listed under Star, uh, 20th Century Fox? Uh, yeah. You gotta remember before, before Lucasfilm got sold, Fox was distributing Star Wars films like the you know, yeah. yeah yeah okay so I just wanted to stop you there so you can you can see where I'm going with this one two because it's really all the same stuff that belongs to them anyway two uh three four so that brings it up to 31 31 out of 64. That's more than that's all. That's literally right about half. Yeah. Because they had one, if I found one more, it would be 32. 31 out of 64 films, Charles, are from one company. So we didn't plan on doing the Disney show today, but I'm just always impressed by what Walt Disney has done. And you know, I know we got to get ready to get out of here soon. Have we done have we cleared the hurdle on our time yet? Because I wasn't, I really wasn't paying attention because we were just in it today. But let's just say, um, you know, quickly, because we talked and teased um, that the Black Real Award nominations are coming up on June the 16th. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that we just had the Black Real Awards back in February, and we keep talking about Disney and Marvel. One of the people that we honored was Nate Moore. Nate Moore, of course, being the highest ranking executive uh, that's African-American at, at Marvel, who's responsible for conversations for Black Panther and Falcon and uh, a lot of the other African-American characters that now dot the Disney landscape. Um, my hat's off to these guys, man. I, I, it really is, man. I'm humbled that I lived in a, in a time where the, the technology finally caught up that these stories can be told to, to erase away the, the, the stench of the, the early 80s when they were trying to tell superhero stories without the special effects and those movies were not good, bruh. Like, woo. Yeah, I mean, Superman, the first Superman was pretty, was half okay, but as it kept going on, it just, you know, but I mean, the, the ground has to be broken somewhere. And so the, they did set set the tone for what was to come. All right, brother. Well, hey, Charles, uh, summer's out. Uh, I mean, it was summer's out. It is now early June. Uh, we are making that mass sprint to the halfway mark of summer, which is the 4th of July. 
And then after the 4th of July, it's all downhill. <laughs> it's just like, if you get to from, from, from the July to 4th down to the end of August, and then we back at it again, it'll be fall, man. But enjoy your summer. Uh, I know we still don't have the prolific outpouring of movies that are typically a part of the summer calendar, Charles. Um, Top Gun Maverick is in theaters. I think it's a really good movie. You should go and check that out. Is there anything else you want to recommend before we get out of here, Charles? Well, no, I think uh, if we talked about the series to watch, Top Gun Maverick is out there. And next week we can talk about what's happening with uh, Jurassic World. All righty. All right. So as we tell you guys every week on the show, man, please see something good at the movies. I am Tim Gordon. That is Charles Kirkland. Episode 503. A wrap. Clapboard. I was trying to clapboard it. Uh, pull back. Ah. <laughs> you guys take care, man, and uh, enjoy your weekend.